Professor Papa Nicolaou, you are an Orthodox theologian of the Greek diaspora, born, raised, and educated in USA. How do you experience the fact that you are an Orthodox thinker in the USA, and what does mean your twofold identity for you? Uh, I'm an Orthodox thinker in the USA, probably because my father was a priest 50 years, and I uh, took a great interest in theology, um, in our Orthodox faith. Um, very young. Uh, I remember my first book, actually, uh, that I read was a Greek translation, uh, English translation of a Greek book that my father got. And I remember I just picked it up and started reading it, and he started to explain various kinds of things. And then I read Callistos' books, where Callistos uh, Ware's book, uh, The Orthodox Church. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, I kept reading and reading and reading. And at some point. Uh, I decided to go for a PhD and become a professor, and, uh, and I think um, it, it gives me an interesting perspective only because I have some sense of the Orthodox world in the traditional Orthodox countries, but I also see what's happening to religion in America as well. Mm -hmm. And so it gives me, it, I have sort of my, uh, as we say in English, my foot in both uh, one part in Greece here in the Orthodox world in Europe and one part in America. I always tell people that when I come to Greece, I feel very American, but when I'm in America, I feel very Greek. So it's a kind of, I feel like I live in the middle somehow, depending on where I'm at. So. Living in distance from uh, Orthodox territories, countries where Orthodoxy is more or less the dominant religion, do you think that is a privilege or a problem about the way you approach Orthodox tradition? It's both a privilege and a problem, I think, uh, because um, when I write about issues uh, in the abstract, such as uh, uh, orthodoxy and politics, um, clearly, I mean, it, my own situation in the United States probably shapes how I approach the issue. Although I think I try to approach the issue in a way that I think can apply to all the orthodox people, and no matter where they are. Um, so in some sense, uh, it, it does affect how I, I see things. So that could be both a problem and a privilege in the sense that uh, it's a problem in the sense that many Orthodox think that uh, maybe I have a bit of a bias, a kind of non or a kind of Western bias. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it could be a privilege because being outside of Orthodox countries and culture, maybe you can see certain things about the Orthodox world that you can't see if you're sort of embedded inside. I always, again, I always like this, I, I tell other Orthodox that uh, one of the greatest creative periods of Orthodox uh, theology happened when uh, Christianity still wasn't uh, the official religion of the Byzantine Empire. And even after Constantine converted, it was still uh, very pagan, actually. Uh, it, only, it was only until about the 6th century that the Christianization really... So, it, I mean, there you have a flowering of creative thought, orthodox thinking, and yet you're in an environment that isn't necessarily yet Christianized. So just because I'm in the West, doesn't necessarily mean that somehow, uh, perhaps, uh, I'm not uh, thinking, let's say, in an authentic way or something like this. I think it might give me a certain uh, chance to uh, be creative in a way that, uh, uh, you know, because I'm forced to think about questions and situations that perhaps don't necessarily come up. Uh, so one example could be, and, and I've heard this when I speak to other Greek theologians, here, it's taken for granted that there are certain people who are authorities, like Maximus the Professor, Gregory the Theologian. It's just taken for granted. When we speak about these figures in, in the Western context, you have to sort of explain why people like this should be uh, authorities. So that, to me, I think that helps sharpen uh, arguments a little bit and helps to see questions and problems that perhaps uh, might be just uh, not be, not, might not emerge because certain things are taken for granted in the Orthodox countries. Mm -hmm. In your writings and uh, lectures, you focus on uh, issues related to Trinitarian and political theology and theological anthropology. Could you tell us who, thinker, person, or reading, has influenced your thought <laughs> and the development of your research agenda? Yeah, I'm laughing because that's easy to answer because the person who absolutely has been influential on me is John Zizioulas, the Metropolitan. Um, I re can remember uh, the day when uh, the famous Father John Meindorf whom I had as a professor, uh, not at St. Vladimir's, but he was actually at Fordham University where I did my undergraduate studies. And I remember when he, uh, when he uh, suggested to me, only a couple of years after it came out, 
being as communion. And I really, I remember reading it for the first time and feeling like I read someone who finally explained to me why orthodoxy makes sense. Um, and uh, ever since then, uh, I know there have been criticisms of his work, but I, I find some of the criticisms valid, I, but I also find some of the criticisms uh, not valid. Uh, and I think that he has offered uh, a, a wonderful creative uh, interpretation of, of the fathers that is uh, very relevant to our everyday lives. And, uh, and I have, it's very, very clear. I've written on Trinity, I've written on um, trauma and the human person, I've written on politics. It's very, very clear that his theology of personhood sort of follows me every time I write a new, and it's not because I have, uh, I feel any kind of loyalty to him, it's only because I'm convinced by uh, the arguments that he gives for thinking of ourselves in terms of a relational understanding of personhood. I think he's, no question, he's one of the greatest uh, orthodox theologians of the 20th century. There are many people who try to criticize him, I think, uh, for political reasons, perhaps, perhaps for personal reasons, uh, uh, and perhaps out of a genuine interest to preserve the patristic tradition, but I think that those criticisms, some criticisms are valid, but many criticisms, I think, are not valid, and I think that he, he will leave a great legacy to the orthodox and to the non-orthodox world. So. Mm -hmm. Is there a particular context, an institution, or a network from which your interest interests originated and, and in which they, are, they were cultivated? Um, I would say no. I mean, I, th I think the, the, the one place that had the greatest influence on my thinking was my PhD program at the University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. There was no orthodox thinker there, but I studied with the Roman Catholic theologian David Tracy, and he had what's called a hermeneutical approach to theology. And I became more and more convinced that that is how theology really developed over time. Um, and it's, many people uh, misunderstand the hermeneutical approach. They think it's very subjective and it doesn't really put an emphasis on truth. That's not true. What it does is it does put an emphasis on what is called truth claims. You make truth claims, but it also makes you aware that what develops is ultimately contextual and it forces you to be a little bit more attentive to other voices and how they may either change your mind, influence your thinking, shape your thinking. So I, uh, I, I noticed that um, after I, I finished uh, my PhD at University of Chicago around 1997, and I noticed that you know, as I, could, I would develop my writing and think about various issues, that that, that training, that experience had a great deal of influence on how I saw uh, uh, the project of doing theology in the, in the 20th and 21st century. So now we would like to introduce you, you in the field of science and orthodoxy relation, which is the core research subject of the law project, show project. We will start with some preliminary, more general questions that you have already treated in your writings, and we deal uh, in a way with the subject so, in your book, edited with Georgi Makopoulos, entitled Orthodox Construction of the West, you underlined that West has been considered by many Orthodox theologians as an absolute marker of difference from what is the essence of Orthodoxy. This narrative of, of uh, East-West opposition as a dominant way to identify Orthodoxy provoked an ambivalence towards Western cultural forms. As modern science is considered to be a fruit of modern West, do you think that this image has affected its relation with Orthodox Christianity? Um, I would say no. I, I think that, uh, I don't think the Orthodox have, have when, when the Orthodox engage in a certain kind of Orthodox construction over the West, uh, against the West, so what they do is they, they kind of create this category of West that has something to do with um, theological mistakes that Augustine made and then uh, ultimately them, those uh, mistakes somehow leading to the kinds of um, events that occurred in the West, such as the you know, Renaissance Reformation, Enlightenment, things like this, and ultimately um, to our postmodern situation. And, and, uh, and, and so they, 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 they sort of create a certain kind of almost um, this, they have this view of history where there's this diametrically opposed civilizations that emerge. And so I think when they, when they think Orthodox construction of the West, they think uh, two things in particular. One, I think they think, uh, first of all, certain theological mistakes, and primarily that the, 
Western theologians uh, rejected theosis and divinization and talked about created grace and uh, and this is this is categorically false. I mean, the 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 notion of created grace did emerge in the West, but it's very very clear that theosis divinization was very very important to the Western thinkers. Um, so there's a theological self-identification against the West. But then there's also now what's, what's emerged that's new as a kind of political self-identification against the West. And so the West is the place where a kind of godless, liberal, secularism emerged. And now we have, in the post-communist situation, orthodox countries that are trying to self-identify against this godless, liberal. And it's not so much they're trying to self-identify against democracy, but they're trying to contextualize democracy and say, well, we have our own orthodox understanding of democracy, which means that we don't accept kind of a godless, liberal sort of uh, situation in the West, which I also think is a, a bit of a caricature. However, when it comes to science, I have not noticed any evidence in any theological writings where that seems to be a problem. However, I think lately, uh, I think there is emerging some self-identification of the West in two areas. One is psychotherapy, so this idea that we have our own unique orthodox psychotherapy over and against psychotherapy of the West is an example, I think, of this constructions of the West and this orthodox self-identification of the West. I don't think that that's true, that we have our own orthodox psychotherapy. I think that we have, we have a, a history of tradition of paying attention to the human being and the human being's emotions and desires and trying to think about that within a particular kind of framework. And I think that that can be brought into conversation with people like Freud, even if he is an atheist. Um, and and I, think, I think it should be brought, because I actually think, ironically, even if he's an atheist, uh, many of the things that Freud uncovered, not everything, like the uh, Oedipal complex, things like that, but other things, I think, can actually contribute to the spiritual life. So I, I, I think there can be a nice conversation there. But I notice in the Orthodox world now, on certain things, that there is a certain now, they've, they've sort of pinpointed certain things in the area of both the social and the heart, natural sciences. Um, one of them is this sort of psychotherapy, this orthodox psychotherapy over and against modern Western psychological models. But then the other thing that's emerging now a little bit, I think, especially more within Russia, is the evolution problem, where there are some people who think that, uh, you know, one has to absolutely uh, reject Western theories of evolution. Uh, and, and affirm ultimately an orthodox understanding of creation and creationism or intelligent design. And I, that, that one is not as prominent, I think. However, I have noticed in the United States where even Sunday school teachers who are influenced by evangelicals, uh, they go to evangelical websites, they get their information from evangelicals, feel that, that when they go into classroom, they actually teach our orthodox kids that they have to reject evolution, which is false. So I do see a little bit of this self-identification emerging in the sciences now uh, in those two areas. Mm -hmm. There are orthodox thinkers uh, who treat the psychoanalysis in the frame of pastoral care as a complement to the sacrament of confession, yeah. not only to forgive sins, but also to heal the suffering of the soul. Can contemporary orthodox theology draw modes of thought, methodological tools, or data from science? Yes. I mean, especially in terms of psychotherapy. Okay, so, I mean, even, okay, so, uh, when you talk about, let's say, Freudian psychoanalysis, Freud had a particular theory, but even that has evolved. So when we talk about Freudian psychoanalysis today, which in many ways is being attacked by more other models like uh, cognitive behavioral therapies and positive psychology, so it's not as if this is the dominant model, it's not. Uh, I do think it's the one model that's a little bit more, has more affinities with orthodox approaches to the human person. But, um, so anyway, even in Freudian, psycho, uh, psycho, when we speak about uh, Freudian psychotherapy, it has, a, it, it has developed over time. I think what happens is, and this is, this is clearly what happened in, with the fathers, I mean, I think as, they, as Christianity grew, let's say, within uh, Roman civilization, I mean, sure, they identified points of mutual ex exclusivity, right? They weren't going to pray to Zeus and things like that, right? But I think they also, those, those aspects that they found were good and helpful, they sort of kind of absorbed inside, you know? And, and it's not like they really 
I think, thought about it. They didn't say, oh, now we will absorb this but reject that. I mean, I just think that those aspects that they thought were good just sort of became part of what might call the texture of Christianity as it started to develop. And I think that that's what we need to do now, too, right? I mean, I think we do it anyway without realizing it. I mean, there are aspects of Freudian psychotherapy and other aspects of psychology, even cognitive behavioral therapy, even positive psychology. I think that when we read them, uh, it's not that we have to, um, you know, uh, proclaim to be atheists in order to integrate all those things. It's just that as we read them, uh, you know, and as we stay faithful to our tradition, sometimes without even thinking, we sort of incorporate those kinds of words and practices in ways that can enrich our understanding of our, of our tradition. So I think um, I don't see uh, by reading and conversa conversing and dialoguing with these various disciplines any threat at all to our tradition at all. I mean, I, in fact, I think that as we do that, we can uh, often integrate various practices and words and other ways to enrich uh, you know, an already very rich tradition. I know that you are interested in the in confession. Yeah. Can you give us uh, an example of this? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I think um, I think one of the uh, one of the things that Freud, I think, uh, especially, I think, was uh, right about was that uh, s telling the truth is not a, a neutral event. Uh, it can be filled with a lot of emotional power. And under the right circumstances, with the right person, through a process, can be very uh, liberating. It can be very, free, very freeing. And I think that uh, in the Orthodox world, sometimes we developed a, as a way to understand why we do confession, we developed a kind of legalistic understanding. A kind of understanding, you know, Christ said to the apostles, do this, and you better, if you do this, there's a kind of contract, like I'll wipe away your sins. And, and so the thing that I've tried to do in, in my work is to show that the Orthodox sometimes are, are self-contradictory. They, they will uh, always talk about uh, uncreated grace and the light and theosis and, and transformation, and then they will somehow talk about certain things very legalistically. And the two things don't go together, you see. So how, is how can we talk about confession in such a way that makes sense in terms of what we say about theosis and transformation and... And that's why I want to, uh, with confession, I kind of sort of, this is a, an example in a way of how I think I absorbed some aspects of Freudian psychotherapy. In the sense that it occurred to me that if you bring, these, if you bring this together with the theology of the icon, what you really start to understand is that when you speak the truth, uh, it really, the power of speaking the truth often depends on who you're telling. So I can uh, speak the truth to uh, a friend, a parent, uh, a therapist. Uh, I can go on a talk show and speak the truth, and it would have a different. Uh, it would have like a, a different, what you know, a rebound effect. Like it, I would, it's like a, bang, a boomerang. Like you would speak it, and it comes back to you, and and it has a bit of a different boomerang effect. And uh, you know, so I can tell you know my parent, I can tell my friend, and. But it's different when you tell a priest, because a priest, by virtue of their being a leader, having a leadership role, they symbolize God in ways that none of us can, with a certain intensity. We all are images of God, but the priest, because of their role in the community, sort of really, I like to use the English, uh, uh, I like to make a verb out of the word icon, they sort of iconicize God in ways that, uh, in, with a certain kind of intensity that we don't, that, that lay people don't have. And it can be very powerful. And so that's how confession, I think, makes sense in a way, right? Because people really do want to talk to God. People really do want to speak to God. And the priest is kind of the closest thing they have. And the priest can iconicize God in ways that a friend and a parent and others really can't. And I think that that makes much more sense about what confession is because as we do that, then what we really do want to feel is the experience of forgiveness. We just don't want someone telling us you're forgiven and go on because there's a contract. We actually want to experience forgiveness. We, want to be feel, we really want to feel that, you know, uh, somehow emotionally um, um, that, we have, you know, that we have been forgiven. And so I think that you know, I think the most I'm trying to do there is try to indicate that truth-telling is not such a neutral event. 
but it can be a very, very powerful, transformative, theosis-like practice. Um, and that's how I think confession uh, makes a little bit more sense than simply, you know, Jesus told the apostles and the apostles gave the power to the bishops and the priests and things like that. That to me doesn't, that to me doesn't really make as much sense. No, no, I'm okay. Yeah. Your, question, your questions are easy now. It's, so far, your questions are easy. Yeah, it's good. Compatibility. Compatibility. Yeah, compatibility. Yeah. 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 No, I'm taxi man. Taxi man. Get that. Christo. Prayer play the role of this which I talk about that in my article. I think prayer can, don't get me wrong, I think it can, and prayer should be considered like a truth-telling. And the person who's very good on this is Anthony Bloom, because mm. he says things like, look, when you go to pray, don't you know, pray the Our Father and things if you don't really want to, but prayer, pray what you want to say to God. You know? And that's very, he's very good on this. But the thing is this, if you go to the privacy of your own room, it's not quite as... Um, it's not quite as risky. See what I'm saying? It's not quite as, you know what I'm saying? It's kind of like saying things on the internet or something, right? I mean, you, when you see the face, it be, you start to realize um, how, how um, important what you want to say is, right? You start to, you know, your heart starts to raise. You 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 want to say something right, to someone. right, right. And, that, and that you almost need to experience all that, right? Because we, uh, what we really want to do is approach the face of God. And if we did approach the face of God with these things, rather than just kind of calling them up on the phone and not, uh, you know, if we really did approach the face of God, that's what we'd be feeling. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? You want to approximate symbolically what it would be like to actually approach God. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? And if you kind of sent God a note or, you know, we're, he was behind the closed door, I don't know, and he didn't know it was you, it wouldn't be quite as intense. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And it would still be at that level of contract. I remember... I yeah. We, 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 uh, they used to take us to confession uh, at uh, mm. cathedral it's, school. It's a, oh, at the Holy Trinity, yeah, yeah, at the Holy Trinity, yeah, Trinity. yeah. And I always had the question, why do I have to confess when I pray and I talk to God directly? And I never got a convincing answer, at least when I was a Is this a convincing answer? Well, it is. It's a, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, but I think, I think, uh, I think that that's, that's the only way I can make sense of it. Right, because I think speaking to God in your own room yeah. is important, um, but it's not quite the same thing as because we really, in order to really experience forgiveness. Let, let me put it this way: if it's if it's something happens between two people, okay, you guys, the two people can communicate through letters, through internet, and it, you know, but it's really when you encounter each other that you know that forgiveness has occurred. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? It, there's some kind of event. Forgiveness is an event. And I think that that's what we want to experience when we're really asking God for forgiveness. That's right. It's more, more of the body. That's a good point. More of the, bo more of the body. Because the body is involved in writing or speaking, but more of the body is involved. So. Although I will say, though, in cases of trauma, even for people to write down in their room in a journal can be very difficult. So that's a form of truth-telling. So it is person to person. Right? I mean, that's a big step for them to write down things that they don't want to speak about, uh, 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 things that they're, you know, uh, in relationship to their trauma. So. Uh, could the interaction between orthodoxy and science enlighten the dark zones of human consciousness as well as its abilities, such as through the field of neuroscience? Mm 
Yeah, I'm, I, I've done a little bit of reading in neuroscience. And I think people are afraid that neuroscience, with neuroscience, that uh, what it means to be human will be kind of reduced to materialism. But I actually, I actually, I actually think the uh, opposite is possible, right? I think that, first of all, we have an incarnational theology. So we have no fear of neuroscience because all neuroscience does really is somehow just manifest at the deepest levels of human consciousness, at the deepest, most material levels of human consciousness, uh, how it is that God becomes incarnate, right? And what I mean by that is this. So I've done some, you know, I've done some studying a little bit on virtues. And uh, you know, so neuroscience can show things like that truth-telling uh, actually affects certain parts of the brain, or that if you lie, it affects certain parts of the brain, right? And so, uh, you know, what we, what, we, what we see there, to some extent, uh, are various kinds of things. One is, for me, it's sort of a, a sign that the body is almost wired in such a way as to give signals, right, when, when things perhaps aren't working quite the way we were created to be, right? So when, the, when lying starts to leave traces in the brain and starts, and starts to form certain kind of um, sort of almost ingrained sort of networks, uh, you know, that's not necessarily a good thing, right? Because then someone becomes a habitual liar and then their relationships can be affected. And, and so I think actually the neuroscience, we have, I don't think we have anything to fear on that because I think the human person is always more than simply what can be registered materially. I, I often use this example with my students. I said, okay, so say there is a funeral and someone goes up and gives a eulogy. And say they take a blood sample or they, they have a PowerPoint and they're giving the report of the person's blood type and sample and what they learn from their blood and they also give a brain scan. I said, do you think that that's everything there is to know about this person? And they get it right away. They say, no. I said, well, what else do you need? What do you else need? And they say, well, you need to tell stories. <laughs> stories that don't get captured in the, in, the, in the brain scans or in the, you know. And now, you know, if you watch Star Trek, this famous show in the United States, Star Trek has this uh, technology where it can do these kinds of memory scans and then maybe we'll have that technology, I don't know. Uh, but at least for now, um, things like brain scans and and, and blood samples can't really tell the whole picture of the person. And even, even when we can take those kinds of measurements, I think what they're showing is that, you know, the kinds of, uh, because orthodoxy once talks about the way God can be uh, presenced in our bodies. The body's not an enemy of God. Sometimes the fathers talk that way, but what they really mean is the bad passions and, right, but the body it wasn't created to be the enemy of God. It was created to inhabit God, to be the temple of God. And what we see with neuroscience quite beautifully is that even at the most deepest material levels, you see, uh, how things like virtues and vices sort of get formed and grained. And I think in many ways it can help us. Uh, uh, I, I th again, I, I think th things like this can help us even understand more clearly uh, what, we, what we mean when we talk about theosis and, and divinization. And transformation of our brain. Correct. Our, uh, mm -hmm. That transformation can, uh, we, we see it both in terms, transformation can be registered in multiple ways. We can see it both in terms of our relationships that we have, because in the end what transformation in terms of the presence of God means that somehow that we're not feeling as angry or hateful or uh, fearful, and that, that transforms the kinds of relationships we have. But then we can see that registered also through brain scans where certain things are, are, are formed, our pathways are kind of um, formed in ways that we see ultimately contribute towards allowing us to relate, to have the kinds of relationships that we really want. Mm -hmm. And one more thing too. I mean, the other thing too is that the notion of how, of how sin can be hereditary, hereditary. In other words, that not sin in the sense of blame, but the sense of that if someone does something in their own lives of drugs or alcohol, that that can get passed on, you see. So in many ways, even the story, if you pay attention to the story of Genesis, what's most fascinating is that when, when God came back and asked, where are you, you know, where are you? 
he sort of was giving them a chance to confess. <laughs> he was giving them a chance to sort of, and uh, Adam sort of blamed Eve, Eve blames the serpent, and you know, through perpetual, through a kind of domino effect of lying and sinning, they set the train in motion for sins to kind of continue one after the other and to sort of even expand and affect future generations. And it's unfair, but we become, in, we become inheritors of those kinds of tendencies and, and somehow we have to you know, engage in certain practices to try to transform ourselves. But the most important thing is that transformation is possible. Uh, and I think it, uh, the measure of those kinds of things uh, uh, are especially in the kinds of relationships we have with others. To what extent is the Orthodox theological tradition absorbing and uh, assimilating uh, currents of modern and postmodern philosophical thought? And under which condition do you believe this could prove to be useful or harmful for the dialogue between science and religion? So it's absorbing in a positive and a negative way. So it's absorbing in the sense of a kind of openness but rootedness in the tradition. And I think the theologians like Zizulis, Vladimir Lossky, um, Sergius Bogakov, Stanilloy, you know, others today are doing this kind of um, absorbing, a kind of good absorbing. I am thinking of what you have said about uh, existential contextuality. Yeah. I have in mind. Can you right. speak of this? Yeah, existential contextuality, uh, when I use the phrase, means that we keep thinking about who we are as human beings, using um, the language, the words, the uh, beliefs of our tradition, but at the same time uh, th really thinking about our human experience in particular kinds of ways, either the experience of trauma or through Stanilloy, the experience of love or Zizulis, the experience of the question, who am I? Uh, and allowing those kinds of questions and reflection in our experience to uh, help us to further make sense uh, of, uh, of our faith. And uh, that's a good um, way of absorbing. A bad way of absorbing is when people try to define orthodoxy over and against other forms of thought, and they create barriers. But it's still an absorbing, because what they don't realize is that by defining over and against, they are somehow affirming the very thing that they're trying to negate. And so in many ways, they're trying to reject this other form of thought that they think is diametrically opposed to orthodoxy, but by doing that they prop it up. And in many ways they, they, they are as much defined by it as they are rejecting it. And that's a bad way of absorbing. Can you uh, give us an example of this? Well, uh, the example I give in terms of orthodox psychotherapy. Uh, so there is you know, a movement in orthodoxy that tries to define a kind of orthodox psychotherapy over and against Western psychotherapy. And so here they are, I mean, in some sense saying, we create a wall here because this is the way I, we do it, this is the way you Westerners do it, uh, you atheist Westerners do it. And so by doing this, I mean, in some ways, you know, you wouldn't even have something called orthodox psychotherapy if there wasn't the Western psychotherapy that they're defining against. So they almost need this thing that they need to define against in order to kind of create. And in that sense, they're absorbing still, but it's a kind of bad absorbing because they're creating this kind of mutual uh, exclusivity, these barriers, and uh, in ways that I think are not helpful and, and, and a bit negative. But didn't early Christianity, in a way, define itself um, against the non-Christian world? Uh, yes and no. Against certain aspects of it, right? Against polytheism. They had arguments against polytheism, but even there, following the lead of St. Paul, I mean, they would at least recognize what was positive is that they worshipped the unknown God or they had some kind of worship in divinity. And yes, there, I mean, no question, there was severe rhetoric at times in terms of the various fathers at various situations. So that has to be taken into account. But like I said as well, I mean, I also think that, I, I don't think that they had this idea of we are Christians, this is the Roman society. I think that they, I think many, I think as we see things develop, I mean, the more and more Christianity started to grow, the less persecutions there were, Christians started to uh, affirm that which was positive within Roman society, and they eventually identified as Romans, 
And so they didn't say, now we've um, abolished the Roman Empire and have established the Christian Empire. No, they Christianized the Roman Empire, which means that they, they, they absorb the laws, many of the philosophical practices, the understanding of the human in terms of the tripartite understanding of the soul. Christians didn't make that up. Uh, so understandings of the virtues. And sure, their own thinking uh, based on the incarnation of Christ, no question, uh, led to transformations in terms of the law code and uh, ways of thinking about the human being and uh, ways of thinking about hospitals and social work and other kinds of things. No, there's no question about that. So there is change, but there's not this over and againstness. There's not this, that's the Roman Empire. Everything now we're just going to destroy. We set up our new, uh, you know, almost sui generis Christian civilization. Uh, because only if it comes from us Christians does it really count and is authentic. And, uh, and that's, a, you know, that's a kind of bad, uh, that's a bad form of self-identification. So yeah, there is argument, there is debate, there is disagreement, there, is, you know, there are things going on there. But it wasn't kind of a full, uh, complete sort of rejection. And in ways they did discern uh, what it is that they could sort of integrate, especially with a focus on the belief that God is incarnate in Jesus. Many Orthodox thinkers, in order to bring closer the theological and scientific uh, discourses, they constantly adopt the exegetical approach of uh, compatibilism, searching for compatibilities between Orthodox and modern science. These options allow for theological, dogmatical, spiritual beliefs to enter into the field of science. For example, the Big Bang gives directly support to the theological belief that the universe has a beginning as it is narrated in the Bible. Do you think that this concordist approach choice brings closure religious to science or provokes confu confusion between them? No, I think it can bring us closer. I think, um, first of all, when it comes to the issues in terms of how to uh, interpret the Bible in relationship to science, one of the big issues is, especially in the theory of evolution, whether, um, we, whether the theory of evolution threatens the Christian interpretation of the literal approach to the Bible. But the thing that has to be remembered is that in the Orthodox tradition, prior to any theory of evolution, that they, there was never an emphasis on the literal, literal approach to the Bible. I mean, sure, there were literal aspects, obviously, the, the, the life of Jesus, the kingdom of Israel, other kinds of things. But they also did understand that the Bible really was a document in which one heard let's say, the Word of God, for contemplation. And so they, they, under, they understood that even in those texts, even in those texts that pointed to historical facts, and they, didn't, they didn't think all of them did, but even to those texts that pointed to a historical fact, that there was even other layers of meaning there, that through contemplation, if they were to be able to uncover a certain truth, let's say, that, they would, that would ultimately unite them more with the Word. So the word is, yes, embedded in the scriptures, but in ways and multiple meanings. So even prior to theories of evolution, the fathers had a much more sophisticated understanding of the scriptures that itself absorbed uh, theories of interpretation from, from ancient sources, ancient Greek and Roman sources, and was ultimately grounded in their belief in terms of the incarnation in the material body of Jesus. Now, when it comes to something like uh, the theory, something like the theory of evolution, I think Galileo once said, I think maybe I'm paraphrasing, he said that, look, when, when, when science discovers something that ultimately contradicts something within the Bible, right, so like Joshua telling the sun to stand still, then that particular verse in the Bible cannot be taken literally. And I think that uh, I do think that science poses challenges for our interpretations of our faith. And we have to just recognize that. I don't think science could ever, ever, ever refute what we ultimately believe in terms of God becoming incarnate and God becoming human so that humans can become God, from, from St. Athanasius. I don't think science can ever 
really refute that point. But the very details in terms of how we try to make, make sense of that, I do think we have to take very seriously scientific advancements and be willing uh, to think about, reinterpret our faith in light of those particular kinds of discoveries. The thing that's harder, and I'm not very clear about, is how it is that theology can maybe impact science. So the scientists, I think, will say, and even some theologians, is that, no, these are two fields, and we just sort of keep them separate. But I'm not, I'm not sure if that works, because I, one could argue that it was a certain way of thinking about God that ultimately led to the development of modern science. So I'm not, I'm not really sure if that's true. And I, I think that what we really need a little more, I think, on the part of the scientists is not so much um, you know, willing to talk to us, but a, a real willingness to kind of really think about the question is what difference do um, certain kinds of beliefs make in terms of how we approach, uh, in terms of the various scientific methodologies? Uh, I, I don't have an answer to that question. I just wish it would be posed as a question. Uh, because I think that um, I think there needs to be a little bit more on the science side in terms of being open to the idea that theology is making truth claims. I'm not asking scientists to believe in God. I'm just asking them to take the theological truth claims seriously. Are there, uh, should, or should there be any limits to this reinterpretation? And who will set this, these limits? I think that's an ongoing discernment of the community, right? I mean, I think that in what's happening so far is things like evolution is threatening uh, the literal interpretation of Genesis 1 to 3, and that's, that's going to you know, affect our, our, uh, credi the, the Bible's credibility, and then, we don't have, you know, then it's going to affect our faith in, Je and faith in Jesus and things like that. And I don't, I don't see any of that. I don't, see, I, I don't think taking Genesis 1 through 3, 1 through 3 non-literally means that that's going to affect my faith in the incarnate God of Jesus. Um, so I think there has to be some discernment, right? I mean, and it comes along with various kinds of issues. Uh, so, you know, evolution is uh, uh, one of these issues. Um, it, it seems that neuroscience now is emerging perhaps as another kind of issue in terms of uh, is the human being simply their brain or not their brain, right? Uh, but, but the idea somehow that science is like my students say, I don't believe in God, I believe in science. Now, that, that's a ridiculous claim in many ways because uh, you know, to say, I believe in science, I, I, I thought science was one of those things, you know, that just sort of, you know, yeah, just kind of told you how things were, what were happening. Why do you have to believe in science, right? And uh, I just think that, um, you know, there, are all, there have been all these predictions for centuries that somehow science is going to kind of progress in such a way that it's going to completely discredit religious beliefs, and I just don't think that itself is a faith position. But now I think things have shifted that, that it's not going to do that. Now, now, again, I recognize that that's a faith position, but it just doesn't seem that science can really progress to the point of answering all the questions in such a way that ultimately we're going to stop thinking about God. I, I just don't think that's going to happen. I do, do think for the Orthodox there is a certain non-negotiable. And that non-negotiable is God became human so that humans can become God. I mean, that really is the core of our faith. But I've yet to see anything within the scientific world um, that really threatens or can threaten that core belief. So the theological anthropology of a more worldly deification is in the heart of your work. Yes. You are also putting forward the understanding of what it means to be human inspired by the Eastern Orthodox theology of the personhood through Maximus' confessor's understanding of the virtue, just as learning how to love. Yeah. In which terms the Maximian anthropological model originated from the ascetical and mystical framework of the 7th century could intersect with the understanding of modern human subject? Oh, I, th I think <laughs> a lot, actually. I mean, I think, um, well, I think that you're right. That In general, what I've discovered is that uh, the Orthodox like to talk about theosis, and then, like, when they talk about politics or, or um, 
when they talk about uh, other aspects, let's say, of theological anthropology, uh, when they talk about even about confession, or it, uh, it, it seems to drop from the picture. It seems to just, you know, um, I want to uh, make theosis more worldly. I want to show how it affects all aspects of our life, even the neuroscientific material kind of register. So that is, a, that is something that, and in talking about uh, uh, John Zulus, I, I, I also sort of bring his theology of personhood as a way of trying to tie all these kind of various strands together. I do think that theosis is not just the thing we see in, you know, in, in the monastery or, you know, the monk with, you know, the light on uh, his or her face or, um, you know, St. Seraphim in the forest. I mean, I think it's in everyday living. Um, so I, I do want to bring it more central um, in politics and in experiences of trauma. And, but then... Um, Somebody asked in the conference, and I think it might have been you, like in terms of theosis, like what, what, is exa- what does it mean? Like how does it exactly look? Someone was asking that question, like what does it exactly look like? I mean, what, it, what does it entail? Uh, what is it sort of... And I think that, that problematizes me too. Like I want to be able to, to more uh, um, think about it in much more rich and concrete detail. And I think the virtues uh, is a way in which we can think about theosis. But what's most fascinating about Maximus is that he, he discusses the virtues in terms of love. Like love is the highest virtue, and all the other virtues are something which kind of contribute to our growing and learning uh, how to love. And I find that to be a very, very rich concept, rich understanding. It's not quite in the virtue literature. Um, uh, some context here is also important in, in, the, in the world of sort of um, secular ethics and philosophical ethics. Um, there has been a revival of what's called virtue ethics since the 1950s. And so uh, in that literature, uh, especially as it moved into the Christian world, there's been a lot of um, reappropriation of Thomas Aquinas. And one of the things that I notice is that in the East, St. Maximus Confessor has one of the most developed forms of virtue, which have a great deal of affinity with Aquinas, actually. So there, I think there's a kind of Christian tradition of virtue, which... Aquinas sort of absorbed, because he was also influenced by John of Damascus. And so, you know, I mean, I think that I'm trying to, um, uh, uh, to lift up uh, this, this um, Maximus's thinking on virtue, because even in the explosion of Maximus scholarship that has come out lately, hardly anybody has talked about his, his understanding of virtue. There are a few things coming out lately now, uh, dissertations and things now, slowly but surely. But there have been at least, there have been multiple, multiple books the last two decades on Maximus, and hardly any of them talk about his understanding of virtue. So I think that uh, his understanding of virtue helps provide a way for us to understand exactly what we mean when we think about the human being progressing in theosis. And uh, it's, it's, it's actually a little bit, it's quite simple in a way, because, I mean, to grow in love is to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul, which means, which means to love your neighbor as yourself. And he identifies three emotions that really get in the way of that, and that is fear, anger, and hatred. And in many ways, he's right. <laughs> Those three things get in the way of developing our relationships. And here is where Freud helps, because Freud can help us understand why it is we experience fear, hatred, and love. Maximus doesn't really under- help us understand why. Maximus is almost kind of a... He's, he would have be been a great cognitive behavioral therapist or a positive psychologist, because he gives advice about how you can get your mind on different things so that somehow you cannot obsess over these emotions. Freud is a little bit different in the sense of like there's something unconscious about what's going on. And I think that there is something about a spiritual practice of self-reflection that will help us to really uncover why we experience anger, fear, and hatred. And here's where you know, truth-telling becomes important and all these things are ultimately uh, uh, leading towards the formation of virtue whether it could be patience or kindness, these are all forms of love, but if you put them all together in kind of a little puzzle, then ultimately they can contribute towards helping us become uh, feeling less 
you know, uh, hatred, fear, and anger, and ultimately becoming more loving beings. In other words, if, noticing that we simply have more of a capacity to give to others, noticing that we're feeling less angry towards the other, or less fearful, or less hate towards the other, and just simply have more of a capacity to be and to give towards the other. To me, that is theosis in all its material, worldly glory. So it's the relation with the others? Yes. As a way to go also good. Correct. Correct. I mean, well, it's, I think it's simultaneous. I think the, the way that we notice how we relate to others is the way we can kind of judge how it is that we love God. So it's simultaneous. So if, and, and see, the thing about Christian faith, and this to me, I think, is really the uniqueness of Christian faith, is that Jesus says, don't simply love your family, your friend. He says, love your, the enemy and the stranger. Right? And... You know, if, if I, you know, I, I can, you know, if I, you know, talk to someone uh, in, in the United States, for example, or maybe some of my students, and, you know, and just simply say, well, you know, I mean, we were created to love the enemy and the stranger, not everybody would really be convinced by that, right? And not everybody needs to be, right? I mean, we could just get along very well and have a nice political system where we treat each other with respect and, you know, have social welfare systems and things like that, but then we could say, well, that, that's, that's fine. But Jesus says, no, you have to love the enemy and the stranger. That's very difficult, right? That's very, very difficult. So if we still feel like we have people that we're angry towards or enemies, if we feel that we pass a homeless person and we don't really want to spend time with them, but we want to go on with our lives, we're not, we, it's not so much that we're not doing what God wants us to do. It's, it's just that we, we at least have to notice that we can be, there's something more that we can be. Right? There's, we can be humans that love more. And, uh, and that, that, that requires a great deal of self-reflection, growth, ascesis, and ultimately it's a process. And I think the virtues become, especially as St. Maximus has talked about them, have become a way of make, trying to make sense exactly of the kind of human experience which, uh, yeah, which, we notice, uh, which we notice is a kind of transformation in such a way that somehow we, we just, again, we just notice that we're relating to people differently, more positively, more lovingly. We notice that perhaps we do want to spend more time with strangers that we don't know, or perhaps that enemies that we once had don't seem to provoke the same kind of reaction that they once did. So, the ascetical, the ascetical experience, I, I, can't, I can't say the mystical experience exactly, includes the others. We have not yes. a self-sufficient subject Correct. who looks at God Correct. and he's perfect, but it's other, is somebody who is involved with people, have the responsibility of uh, other Correct. people, something like this. I think the ascetical experience always entails the other. Uh, now, someone will, some, uh, some, I can anticipate someone in the Orthodox world saying this, but what about the hermit who goes lives by himself? I think, I mean, in some sense, there is a kind of otherness. It, there's no way that we cannot somehow relate to the other. We're always relating to the other. So in many ways, that's a sort of relating to the other of trying to isolate oneself in order to kind of focus on life with God. I'm not going to condemn that. Um, but... I, I, I'm, it's, one cannot say it's a kind of uh, it's a kind of spiritual life that does not include the other, but it's an including the other that decides that they want to ultimately, you know, uh, not not really relate to the other in order to kind of focus on the life of God. So here I might be uh, indicating to some extent my preference for more forms of communal life within the Orthodox world that developed monasticism, only because the other is very much a part of our struggle to love God. Because that's the way Jesus laid it out. I mean, there's no separation, love of God, love of neighbor. It's the same. It's, it's all happening simultaneously. Um, it's, it's not that we love God first and then we're going to start loving others. It's just all happening simultaneously. And so I do think that the ascetical life always uh, has something to do with uh, the other who is, I guess, both near and far from us. Mm -hmm.
Can science be in, the, in a sense part of this anthropological project? I think so. I mean, I think, uh, I, I really believe that science, um, I, I don't know a lot about the philosophy of science, but I do, I do think science can help us illuminate, uh, especially in terms of a theological anthropology, things that are happening within the body. I think uh, there's a lot of debate about uh, psychology as a science. Um, but even if it's in the realm, let's say, of, in the, of, of, of a kind of science, uh, and it's using its own distinct methodology, um, you know, I think that we can, uh, we can learn from whatever perspective uh, they bring to the human person, from their own particular presuppositions and using their own methodology. I think the layer that our Christian faith brings is that the hu what's possible for the human is to grow in love. What's possible for the human is to be a more loving being. What's possible for the human is to love the stranger and the enemy. And more theologically, what's possible for the human is to love God with all of one's heart, mind, and soul, which means to love in the world as God loves. I mean, God, no matter what anybody does, no matter the most heinous crime, no matter whatever, God still loves them. Now, what, somebody asked me once, like, well, what does that look like? And I, I can tell you what it looks like. It means that if someone has done something to you and you feel really anger and hurtfulness from it, to love as God loved means that when you face that person, it's not that you're telling them like just to forget about it or it's, you still, you know, justice is also a part of what God is. So you can tell them that what they did is wrong. But to love as God love means that you don't reduce them to that event. That you can see them more. That you can see both their past, which may have influenced whatever they've done, doesn't excuse it, but at least gives you some context. And you can see the future. You can see what's possible for them under the right relationships and the right conditions. And I think science can help us illuminate what is going on with us as we think about the fact that the human was created for, the, for this. I. I, don't, I just really don't believe that anything that science comes up with, at least in the remainder of my lifetime, will ever, ever discredit that belief. And I very much believe that we can grow in that love by focusing on the person of Jesus Christ and within the Orthodox tradition. I, I believe that very strongly, actually. But I think if you do orthodoxy to legalism, and rules and correct expressions and old calendars and things like that, then you create, uh, I mean, the old calendar thing is just the most obvious example of just simply rejection of what's manifestly true. I mean, we, we, the old calendar is just simply a rejection of a, is simply a rejection of an astronomically more correct calendar. <laughs> I mean, that's, you know, um, it, it tells you this self-identification to the extreme. Um, I think when you reduce orthodoxy to those things, then you lose focus on uh, orthodoxy as transformation. But there have been uh, attempts by scientists to explain yeah. uh, things that uh, theology um, uh, explains in the ways of yep. God. For example, to my mind comes a book written some years ago by Francis Crick, which tries to explain what the soul is right. in terms of science. Right. And what he does is that he just tells us that it's all a set of chemical reactions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How, does, how does theology come and say and, and discredit these views if should, they should be discredited? Right. And is there anything that theology can take from this? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I'd have to know that, okay, and there are even other theories, right? I remember listening to interviews of a woman who talks about, uh, who also talks a little bit about um, neuroscience in such a way that it has nothing to do with religion, but she just thinks that humans aren't free, right? She just thinks there's no such thing as freedom. And um, I think we have to take those, I think we have to take those positions very, very seriously. I do, but 
My experience has been that anybody, anytime anybody takes a position within even the scientific world, um, that they're, especially on those issues of freedom, and the issues, for example, of what we call an interior life, let's say a soul, we can, a soul really, the word soul really is having something to do with that there is a, something about an interior life that's just not reducible to material forms. Anybody, anytime everybody takes position, those kinds of positions, I've noticed that even within that scientific world, there's always debate, which means that they've identified the fact that chemical reactions exist, but once they kind of make that little step further, they're somehow going, they're transgressing their own bounds. So even this woman, by looking at, you know, uh, the woman that said there's no freedom, I mean, by, you know, by looking at the kind of research she does, the kind of uh, processes that the brain goes through in terms of making decisions, and, uh, and it's a very serious, you know, look, it's a very serious kind of claim. I've noticed that there's always debates only because, you know, once they make that little, slight little leap and make that claim there is no freedom, in the philosophical world we all know that, you know, the, whether we have freedom or not is an ultimately unprovable claim. So either way, it's just something that you have to postulate. You have to act, act, act as if, right? That, that human experience is such that, you know, even if you were right, what would that mean for us? <laughs> I mean, like, how do we even adapt to that? <laughs> do you see what I'm saying? I mean, so I think, I, I always, what I notice is that I, I take very serious those claims, I will read them, I don't want to create this kind of, oh, those, those atheists again, they're out to get us or whatever. I just think that my experience has been that pe once people do the kind of research they do and they make that leap, they're always kind of moving into the philosophical and the theological realm. And that's when the debate, I think, starts to change a little bit more broadly in terms of who are we as human persons, what does that mean, um, you know, uh, yeah, and I think that that's, that's where the terms of the debate start to, to change, I think for them without, and it's, it's very, very, again, it's very, even the women that, okay, here are what's happening in terms of various processes of the brain when we make a decision, therefore there is no freedom, is very, very similar to like, well, here's, you know, evolution and so on and so forth, therefore there is no God. It, it, it presupposes immediately what freedom is, what God is. So that, that little leap of claim immediately sort of indicates certain presuppositions about the very thing you're trying to deny. So do you think that contemporary orthodox theology by a new hermeneutical approach of the patristic tradition could possibly indicate new points of convergence between rationalism and faith, orthodoxy and science? Definitely. I mean, I think, I think we have to, um, there are Orthodox who would like to see our tradition as a series of already decided and defined propositions that are off limits for discussion. And I think that um, if you really see the councils of the church, that we actually have very few dogmas. People will talk about the dogma of the divine energies. Well, that was never really defined as a dogma. By, it was defined by a council, but not an ecumenical council. There's some debate about whether it's an ecumenical council, but it hasn't been declared that way. Um, so in many ways, the dogmas are not many, and the dogmas always try to say very few words in order to keep people from defining Christ either too much towards the humanity or too much towards the divinity. The problem usually was too much towards the divinity. And so in that sense, I think the dogmas provide sort of the rules for discussion. And they provide room for discussion under certain kinds of rules. The mistake we make in orthodoxy is that we think orthodoxy means don't discuss anything. That everything has been so defined where we can't discuss anything. That's the mistake we make about what orthodoxy means. And so I think there's all kinds of room for it. We have to. We have to take very seriously the latest in various uh, fields of science, the debates within those sciences. We have to take very, very seriously the debates about consciousness and mind and freedom and neuroscience and all these things. We, we have to. We have to take those things very, very seriously. Sure, maybe 
maybe one day it might lead to the conclusion that there is no God. I really don't think that's going to happen, though. I don't think it can. I don't think because I think that the claim that there is a God is something different from... It's a different kind of claim than a scientific claim. And I just, but I do think that the thinking about God and God's relationship to the world and even who we are as human beings, because I do think the human, just that example that when you talk about, uh, a, when you give a eulogy at a funeral that you have to tell stories, shows how important narrative is to understanding the whole human person, right? And narrative is a, is a genre. It's a particular form, right? And you need poetry and you need dance and you need icons and paintings and that's because the fullness of the human experience is expressed through all these forms. Science is one form, a necessary, absolutely important. So if someone has a eulogy and had the brain scan and tell something about the person, that would be a true thing. It's not false. It's a true thing. It's just not the whole person. We need multiple forms. And in the end, um, you know, the religious forms emerge because humans are beings that are on the edge of the finite and the infinite. Right? They are, they are on that edge. We are always somehow humans that are encountering, encountering an infinite horizon, and we're the only species, at least as far as we know, that are conscious of that encounter with the infinite horizon. And in the end, uh, I think we need uh, to speak a little bit more broadly now, I think we need uh, religious symbols and forms to make sense of the fullness of the human experience. As an Orthodox, I think we need, you know, we need the icon of Christ, which I believe, without feeling the need to compare I, I, with any other religion, I just believe that uh, focusing on the person of Christ can help us to become more loving beings. So, can someone become more loving in another way? I don't know, maybe. But I just know that focusing on Christ through ascesis can, can work. You think that uh, uh, there are any overlooked aspects of the Orthodox tradition uh, which can be used in order to reshape the approach of Orthodox Christians towards mo modern science? I don't know, to be honest. I, I do, what I do know is this. I, what I do know is that I think that we tell a certain story about orthodoxy that sometimes means that we cover up other aspects. What I've noticed in my studies of orthodoxy is that I've been told a certain story, and then as I read more and more, I discover parts that weren't part of that story. So I was told that Sergius Bielgakov is not a real theologian, and that's false. I, we talked about Maximus and will and his, you know, his, his debate on the Christ and the will. And the, and then uh, I, I realized that he has a whole treatise on virtues. <laughs> so you just, you know, you, 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 you got to be uh, open to being surprised. Because sometimes it's okay. I mean, we all want to tell the story of orthodoxy. But when we tell the story of orthodoxy, sometimes we leave things out. And that story can get a little bit hardened. And, um, you know, part of the narrative of contemporary orthodox theology has something to do with you know, we believe in energies and theoses, and the, and the West doesn't. And, and now a, a new story is emerging about how we have a particular way of thinking about church-state relations and democracy against the secular godless West. And so we have to be very careful that these stories that we use to help people just sort of with a basic understanding of orthodoxy can be very hardened. And I, so I don't, I don't know particularly if there are aspects that we should uncover for science, but I wouldn't be surprised that if when I engage science and my tradition at the same time, that I might find things that weren't, I wasn't aware of that then could be used to help our relationship with science. Okay, Professor Papanicolaou, in your writings, you relate your anthropological interest to political theology. Modern science is not a neutral field of knowledge and practices aiming at effectively controlling various fields of phenomena. With its methods, its finality, science is above all a human activity based on choice that crucially involves individual, social, and spir cultural spiritual value. Mm -hmm. So it's linked to ethical option. Yeah. Do you think that uh, contemporary Orthodox theology inspired by the Eastern Orthodox notion of virtue has or could have a critical role to play in this field? 
Yes, I mean, I think that, um, yeah, to be honest, I don't know what more I could say that other than what I just said before previously after this question, yeah. I mean, I think that, uh, I think that um, the real challenge is for orthodoxy to pay attention to the sciences and not be afraid to think through those aspects like, you know, when it comes to the human person, I mean, we, we used to talk about it in terms of the tripod understanding of the soul, but that doesn't mean that we can't necessarily talk about the human person in other ways. We don't always have to be stuck to the tripod understanding of the soul. At the same time, the real challenge, I think, to some extent, is the scientists uh, taking the truth claims of the religious. I think in the area of psychology and spirituality, and even in neuroscience, I think actually, I think this is kind of ironic, especially in neuroscience, I think that what neuroscience is going to indicate, I think, and it's starting to indicate, is that every human being, we already kind of know this, but every human being is, is really wired in an in a, in absolutely unique way. And that there are multiple things that we need to hide, try to make sense of what is really happening and who the human person is and how we may be able to solve certain kinds of problems. And so I think that um, I think the, uh, neuroscience might indicate the need broadly for the humanities <laughs> uh, uh, for understanding the fullness of the human person. And um, so I think that um, the, the challenge to some extent, um, and even in the area of psychology and religion, I mean, I think you, know, you see a much more openness even amongst practitioners of of allowing people's religious beliefs to kind of flow into ways of thinking about moving persons towards, away from practices and other kinds of pathologies that they're experiencing. But again, I think in, the, in terms of the hard or natural sciences, it becomes a little more difficult for them to be really open to how exactly uh, ways of thinking about God could even impact ways in which they approach their own field. So. Uh, what are, from your point of view, the limits of the dialogue between science and orthodoxy? Is there limits? Well, I think the limits on the science side are when they start to do theology simply on the basis of their findings. I'm not saying that scientific findings shouldn't play a role in terms of how people theologize. It should. But when, when scientists start to make claims simply based on what they're discovering, I think that that starts to transgress certain limits. I think on the theology side, when certain beliefs force you, for, because of purposes of self-identification, to reject what's emerging as a consensus in science. So I think the Christian, our Christian rejection of evolution has been very problematic, only because it's been motivated by what they think to be a kind of modern attack on religion. And so I think that the limits have something to do more with when each, um, each area, I think, is not aware of its own limits. They're trying to sort of transgress. Uh, and that's the thing. I mean, in other words, I'm trying to say that I think science is, should be important for th theologizing. And I guess I'm trying to say, I think theology should be important for science, but I'm not quite sure how to say that. And I think that's a, that's a question that is a conference in and of itself. How can theology be important for doing science? Um, how do you think we can approach this methodologically? I don't know. No, I know. The first step would be a committee, perhaps. <laughs> or finding the, I think finding the kinds of people that would even be willing to think about the question. You can do it historically, right, to kind of show how, in fact, ways of thinking about the transcendent have impacted ways of people thinking about science throughout the world over time, right? I mean, I think there have been various Chinese forms of science which have, may have been different because of ways of them thinking about the transcendent. Um, and then more constructively in terms of people really, really uh, thinking about uh, how um, ways of conceiving conceptualizing the transcendent somehow might impact uh, ways in which um, they, they, they think about doing, I guess, doing science within their various 
uh, which in the multiple various disciplines of science. I don't, I don't, I don't have an easy answer to your question. I, at most, I just, I don't see anybody considering that question. You know, in other words, how is it that certain presuppositions about, how is it that certain presuppositions about God actually affect how one does science? So I think it's an interesting question to pose. Now you've got to find the people willing to, it'd be easy on the theology side, you need to find people on the science side willing to think about it. And the last question, do you think that contemporary Orthodox theologians must be in dialogue with Christian or other confessions in the field of the relation between Christianity and science? Yeah, no question about it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's, I mean, we have to see, um, this in many ways relates to the previous thing I just said, that we have to, it would be part of a larger thinking about how, in fact, certain ways of thinking about God might impact how we see science, perhaps how we do science, how we integrate various kinds of um, things within science. Like, you know, I, again, is it, is it the case that Christians have to uh, reject evolution, or can we think about a God-world relationship as Bulgakov did, where he didn't see it as a problem? Uh, he really didn't see it as a problem. Um, he's quite unique in many ways. I mean, he was, very, he was writing in the 1930s. He was very aware of the debates. He was very well read. And, he just didn't. He just thought that the problem emerged because people just had bad ideas about God <laughs> uh, on both sides. And so, I mean, I think we should be. I think that. I think we need absolutely to be looking and reading and thinking with other uh, Christians, you know, the religious traditions about how they're thinking about this problem of, um, you know, you know what people might say that relating to something transcendent and ultimately a, a, a form of knowledge that is, has something to do with making sense of, um, um, you know, what, what could say is um, our embeddedness and imminence. And um, yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much for this interview. Thank you. you want to yes, no, uh, I just wanted to ask if you have anything to add. Uh, if you would like to say yes. something to no, other than praise for this effort, uh, you know, and uh, I know it's a very uh, important first step. And uh, no, I, I just uh, I hope that I just I, I just hope that the science religion thing just stops moving beyond this false mutual exclusivity yeah. thing, and uh, they they. But again, I, I said this many times, but I think what what. What keeps coming back to me is, you know, I keep hearing that science just does its own thing and it doesn't pay attention to philosophy of science or theology or anything. And I just wonder whether, I just wonder whether, uh, I just wonder whether that's the right approach. I, I, I honestly don't know the answer to that question. I just think that no one's willing to ask it. I just think we have to start willing to ask it. Um, so. Well, thank you very much. Sure, thank you. Thank you.